Hello, Rue. We're just going to wait a minute for everybody to join. All right, excellent. So I'm Merit Sikovic. Uh, today, we're going to use our weekly uh, uh, Healy ALS platform update to talk about the recent results of Regimen C, the CNAU8 results. Joined here today by uh, Sabrina Paganoni, the co-PI of the platform trial, uh, Lori Chipnick, who's one of our uh, phenomenal statisticians who we've met before in some of her uh, uh, teaching and learnings about statistics. Um, Michael Hodgkin from Clean, um, and Nick Maragakis, who's one of the um, co-leads of, of Regiment C. Uh, Catherine Small, who you know is our, our uh, navigator for the platform trial, as well as Alison Boulat. Uh, Lindsay uh, Potier, who's one of our uh, senior project managers for the platform trial. And uh, Austin Reinders and Jennifer from uh, Clean. Um, so we just have a few slides updates and then really here uh, to answer your uh, questions um, and talk about next steps. Um, so first of all, just a huge thank you for uh, all of you who come every week and um, in particular, thanks for the participants in uh, Regiment C as well as the other um, regiments um, as all that data was um, enormously helpful so we could get answers to some of these early uh, treatments in the platform trial. Next slide, please. Um, as as you um, as you all know, who we'll come here every week, uh, the goal of the platform trial is to be efficient in how we screen through um, drugs for possible efficacy as well as safety uh, in people with ALS. This was designed as a phase two uh, um, network, um, and we currently have five regiments, of which um, four have completed the double blind period, and one is actively enrolling. That's a trihelose one. We have now 105 people enrolled in the regimen E, or the pink one here, trihelose, and we are uh, looking for 160, so that's actively recruiting. Um, part of the efficiency of the platform trial um, is that we share the data from the people um, who are on placebo in each of the regimens uh, so that fewer people are on placebo. We also can add regimens efficiently um, uh, as amendments to the protocol rather than starting fresh as is done when you have one trial at a time. Next slide, please. Uh, so I want to take a moment just uh, to uh, thank the leadership team of Regiment C. Uh, this was led by Dr. James Berry and by Dr. Nicholas Maragakis, uh, who's from uh, Hopkins. And uh, I don't know, Nick, if you wanted to say a few words. No, I would just echo what you had said, thanks to the participants um, who are helping us try to understand more about what I think is a really interesting compound. And um, also thanks to my co-lead, um, James Berry and the, and the Mass General Healy team. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And Nick did some of the science for this drug. So if any any tough questions, we're going to direct uh, to Nick uh, on, on the science. But uh, seriously, he's a, he's a phenomenal scientist. And so please uh, send any questions his way. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for this uh, regimen, uh, 54 of our sites were are participating in, uh, in this enrolled people in Regiment C. You can see them all listed here. I get a huge thanks to them and their, their teams for the great uh, work that they did and the quality of the data that they provided. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Regiment C uh, is CNMAU8. This is an oral suspension of gold nanocrystals that was developed to uh, restore neuronal health and function by e increasing energy production and utilization. In this regimen, we tested two doses, 30 milligrams a day versus, or 60 milligrams a day. Um, and we all our, our initial uh, primary analyses we're comparing the, the data from the combined dosages versus placebo. So this um, was of, of the four regimens, the only one that did also do what we call dose finding, uh, which is really important in early phase development. Um, but I wanted to point out that the, the initial analyses were the combined dose versus placebo. 
Um, regimen C also chose to use the shared placebo data from all of the four regimens. The regimens were given a choice whether to use the placebo data from D or not, because it meant uh, waiting additional time for that data to be available since that regimen started after A, B, and C. Um, so um, that's important also for people to know. And as I said, the primary analyses are the combined dose uh, versus placebo. Next slide, please. So I, I'm going to turn the, the, the Zoom baton over to Dr. Chipnick to explain uh, the statistics and the results. Sure, thank you. Um, so what we have here are the primary and secondary analyses. As with any um, trial, we need to specify this before the first patient is enrolled. So our primary analysis was disease progression measured from the ALS FRSR total score. Um, and this is a model, it's, uh, we actually use what's called a Bayesian shared parameter model um, that is able to analyze both uh, the change in ALS FRSR score and um, mortality, um, and mortality defined as death or uh, permanent assisted ventilation. Um, and that's our primary model. And as was mentioned, our primary analysis is everyone who was on the drug. So we combine the doses as compared to all the placebos shared. We did some additional secondary analyses using um, what's called a non-parametric model that can assess both uh, ALS FRSR function um, and survival called a CAFS model. And also looked at some standard, uh, what's called frequentist statistics, uh, looking at change in the function score, change in slow vital capacity, and ultimately survival to the 24 week end point. Um, uh, any exploratory analyses aren't included right now. These are the primary and secondary that we pre-specified. So next slide, please. Um, just to take you through how everybody made it to the end of the study, um, we had 523 uh, participants that were assessed for eligibility in A, B, and C. Remember the placebos from that group make it on to be placebos um, in our comparisons for this regimen. 163 people uh, were assessed for eligibility in RGC, um, Regimen C. Uh, two of them were excluded, um, which left 161 randomized within the regimen. That was split up into 42 in placebo, 59 in the 30 milligram group, and 61 in the 60 milligram group. Added to the 41 placebo are an additional 123 that came from regimens A, B, and C, giving us a total of 164 placebo. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, we do, even though it is randomized, which is to assure that it's an equal among uh, each group, so we would say equal distribution of these characteristics among the groups, um, we do do analysis to in, uh, ensure that that's the case. So between the, um, uh, uh, the group that got the active drug and the groups that got the placebo, um, and this includes all placebo, they were well balanced on all the characteristics that you see on the screen right now. There was a slight difference in um, l escarol criteria um, with slightly more probable and fewer probable lab supported in the active group. Next slide, please. So here are the primary, the results of the primary model. And again, this is this Bayesian shared parameter model, um, but I'll explain to you what you're seeing on the screen here. Um, so on the x-axis, you have the weeks in the trial. Um, down at the bottom, if we start down there, um, you have uh, in purple, you have the number of people that were considered at that point. Um, in the time, uh, in the time. So uh, as it goes down, as people might drop out of the trial, that number gets a little bit lower. In the gray, you have the number of people within the placebo group in regimen C placebo as it goes further. Um, what the graph is showing you is the trajectory of this ALS FRSR score over time. It's averaged. Um, these are what's called um, predicted average for a group. So the purple line is what we see as average for the uh, people that were on the active drug. And this is again, combined 30 and 60 milligrams. The gray line, which unfortunately is directly underneath the purple line. So it's a little hard to see 
is what we're seeing for people that were in the placebo that included the placebos in other groups as well. Um, this is this model actually had a very good fit, but as you can see, there is really no visible differences between the purple line and the gray line in terms of change in ALS or slowing of ALS FRSR. Um, this is borne out by the statistics as well. Um, next slide, please. We did also do a secondary analysis looking at survival. So this is an analysis where the outcome is death or permanent assisted ventilation. We are able, this is called a Cox proportional hazard regression for those who have taken their stats courses. Um, we are able to take into account not just the event of death or permanent assisted ventilation, but also time to that event um, and come up with something called a hazard ratio. A hazard ratio can be interpreted as either increase or decrease risk of having that event for people in the, on the drug versus people that were on the placebo. So let me explain what's on this slide. Over here on the left, we have just looking at the 30 milligram dose group, we, actually, we see a 94% decrease in risk of death um, or permanent assisted ventilation as compared to people on the placebo. So this top line here is an outcome of either death or permanent assisted ventilation. The bottom line is only looking at death. Um, we normally look at these p-values to be less than 0.05 or a lower than 5%, um, a lower than 5% chance that we saw these results by just chance alone. Um, we also are looking for how wide this bar is. So zero would mean no decrease and no increase, meaning we don't see a difference between the drug or the placebo. So we look to see if this line um, crosses that zero. And as you can see for the 30 milligram versus all the placebos, it does not. Um, this is called a confidence interval. We might think of it as a margin of error. We did a, a secondary analysis where we just look at 30 milligram versus just the placebos in the regimen C. Um, we see again, a very large decreased risk of uh, mortality or permanent assisted ventilation for those on 30 milligrams compared to just the 41 placebos that were in um, the 30 milligram group. Um, and here we can actually um, give you more specific numbers of events. Um, this indicates that there was one event in uh, one death or permanent assisted ventilation in the 30 milligram group as opposed to four in the regimen C placebos. We list these as less than 10 because there's still uh, some time that we're waiting until regimen D is completely unblinded to share those numbers. Um, but we these numbers that are calculated from them are calculated from the absolute numbers. Again, we're seeing these p-values less than 0.05, which indicates that this is not what we would expect to get by chance. And I should add that all of these models are adjusted for uh, multiple measures, including, including time since symptom onset, pre-baseline change in ALS FRSR, um, use of the two drugs, and age. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Go I said, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, it's all you. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is just a summary that um, uh, for regimen C, the, the primary and the key secondary endpoints uh, were not met at the 24 uh, weeks. However, there was a pre-specified um, exploratory analysis of survival endpoint um, by dose. And when we looked at that, we did see a, a, a statistically significant reduction in the risk of mortality or the use of a permanently assisted ventilation um, uh, and when we adjusted for some imbalances in the, the baseline risks. And that was seen um, at only at the 30 milligram dose. Um, this, the drug was well tolerated. Uh, there weren't any significant safety findings. 
Uh, we still have additional analyses to do. Uh, these are really what we call the top line results, but there's additional analyses that will be coming that include some exploratory outcomes such as um, a voice, uh, an, a digital app for voice, uh, the home spirometry, um, some fluid biomarkers, and, and some subgroup analyses. Uh, and those are expected in the coming months, and they'll be uh, presented um, at an upcoming meeting. And of course, as always, we would share it on webinars for the participants as well as people with ALS. Next slide, please. So the next step, so, um, uh, and then I wanna uh, ask Michael if he could say a few words. Um, we have, have the steering committee, uh, you know, with the company and the investigators have decided that we, we would like to continue the open label extension. We're planning to do it. We will do that at the 30 milligram a day dose only. So people who are on the 60 and the open label extension would be moved uh, to the 30. Um, in addition, there is an ongoing expanded access program at uh, four centers. And we're very grateful for Clean for making that um, an option during the, the trial for people who are not eligible for the trial, and that's going to continue. That was already at 30 milligrams a day, so that's going to continue at 30 milligrams a day. Uh, we have ongoing discussions uh, with CLEAN uh, on the option to make that EAP uh, perhaps bigger, and then what would be the next steps around a possible phase three uh, trial at the dosage of 30 milligrams per day. And Michael, I, I don't know if this is a good time for you to, to speak or say some words from CLEAN. I just, on behalf of Queen, I wanted to thank all of the participants who um, were in Regimen C, Regimens A, B, and D as well. Um, doing clinical research is, is never easy, um, but together we're all moving um, the standard of care forward. So thank you for your participation. Thank you specifically to Drs. Maragakis and Barry for shepherding Regimen uh, C forward. And thank you for the entire team at Healy and all the magnif and magnificent scientific work that you've achieved and accomplished. And, designing, implementing, and conducting the platform trial. Um, we are in active dialogue with MGH to potentially expand the offering of expanded access to CNMA U8 and further details will be forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you. I think that might be the last slide that we could Oh no, one more, sorry. <laughs> so we did share these results uh, Monday morning. Um, and uh, we, we spoke to the sites on Monday afternoon so that they would have the information to share with their participants. Today is our first public webinar, and then we have a, a webinar just for the participants in Regiment C uh, that, uh, next week, as well as the EAP. And they will be getting the link for that webinar from the site where they were uh, either participating in the EAP or the, um, the Regiment C platform trial. And we are you know, planning some more public uh, you know, paper and um, more detailed um, uh, publication, that then, you know, especially when we get the rest of the results. So now I think we can take down the slide and go to Q&A, which I think Sabrina is going to moderate. Yes, I would be happy to. As always, we are receiving um, a large number of questions and many of them very detailed and uh, even on the statistics. So we'll try to take them in the order they were asked. So the first question is, how does one interpret the fact that there were no positive results on function as measured by the ALSFRSR score, but there was positive impact on survival? And specifically, the question is, how can one patient survive longer if there's no improvement in the ALSFRSR score? I don't know if, uh, Mary, do you want to go first with that? Yeah, I'm happy. It's a very key, a very important question, and one that we we're you know, really just trying to dive into ourselves, as well as you know when we have additional data, um, which I think is really important. Just to remember that we we only have the top line results. Um, a couple things to think of. One is that we know that this drug uh, takes a while to reach steady state and get into the the, the right concentration you need in the brain. So one possibility is that you need more time to see the effect on function. That's a hypothesis. It's something that the um, CLEAN has seen in their uh, trial that they ran in Australia. So that's one possibility. The other is that um, you know ALSFRS is correlated to um, survival, but it's not 99% uh, correlated. There are other factors that determine um, longevity, and there might be that the that this drug is working on something different that that the ALSFRS cannot measure that accurately. I mean, that's just a, a hypothesis, but it's, I'm not surprised that we might see other drugs like this. And I, I don't know, Nick, if, or, or Michael, if you have other thoughts on this. Well, I think with regard, 
to mechanism of action, I think it's uh, I think it's a good point that does reflect some of Clean's data, and Michael can speak to this potentially with regard to their previous study, um, the rescue study in in Australia. So, I, I think again, I think it's an interesting compound, and we can certainly learn a lot more about how long it might take for this drug to have um, to have an effect. And and I would echo the same. I think that's a, a succinct summary. Great. There's another question that kind of relates to this. It says, you know, it's great that in, in this uh, trial, we have broad inclusion criteria and people can be included uh, within three years from symptom onset as opposed to um, two years, for example, for other trials. But then the fact that this is a broader population, would that make it more difficult to show efficacy? The normality yeah, study. yeah, no, it's a really good question. I think, um, you know, we we have a broad criteria because we think these initial drugs that we picked, um, you know, could benefit, you know, this broader population. Because we have not yet finished all the um, analyses, we have not yet had a chance to look at whether there were different effects, for example, in people earlier in the illness or with different rates of progression. That is all planned and pre-specified, but we can't do that until um, regimen D is locked. And um, and and uh, because of, of you know very statistical reasons, so we we just don't have that data right now. Great. There's a very specific question about the results. Uh, how many patients died in the high dose group during the trial? And I, I don't know if you want uh, our statistician to comment on that, Lori. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so I, I do have those numbers. So um, in the 60 milligram group, we saw three deaths and one um, permanent assisted ventilation. Um, and again, in the 30 milligram group, there was uh, one death. And the regimen C placebo, it was also three deaths and one permanent assisted ventilation. Of course, we're sorry that anybody passed away in this study, but the numbers are small, but there, again, there's, there's a statistically significant difference at the 30 milligram dose. So what do these results say in terms of quality of life? Uh, would somebody should, you know, have better quality of life if they take the drug? I think we don't know. And the reason we don't know is we did not um, design this trial to look at that. And uh, often quality of life scales are, are come in a phase three or in a later stage development um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is we have gotten feedback from participants that they don't particularly uh, like the, the questions that we have uh, for quality of life. Sometimes they're, they're quite long and burdensome. And the other is that they're actually not that good at telling quality of life in AOS. So there's a lot of work that has to be done. And uh, Dr. Simmons at Penn State is, is really the leader into how do you actually measure quality of life with AOS? So in this uh, platform trial, we do not have any measures of that. So, so there's a question, uh, kind of, you know, I'm gonna shorten it, but essentially says that there were some negative results that were presented today and one positive result. So. What makes you think that these, the, the positive result is not uh, kind of a coincidence due to the fact that there were uh, very few people who died or, or reached the survival endpoint? I don't know who wants to take that. Yeah, I'm happy to start with good. I mean, I think, I think we don't know. Um, um, there were small numbers, but it was pretty robust signal statistically. Um, I think the only way to know is, is actually to do, to do another study. And I think given where the field of ALS is, where um, you know, we, we still have huge unmet needs, even with the recent approval of Amelix, I don't think you wanna leave something that could potentially have a big impact on survival on the table untested. The other thing is that the results are in line with the prior study, uh, the rescue study um, from Australia. So we in a way have two studies that are kind of pointing in the same direction, which again, for me means uh, you, sh you should, Keep looking at it, um, and that you know how to look at it is next question. That's what's in, um, that's starting those discussions. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, rescue LS trial because there is a question about um, subgroups. Uh, so there was there were a few subgroup analyses uh, in people with limb onset versus bulbar onset in the rescue ALS trial, a separate trial. So did we do this type of analysis? Well, did we see similar results? I don't know, Laurie, if you want to comment on that or. Um, they are they are being done as we speak. They are they are on the list of ones to be done. They have not been completed yet. 
Great. So today we, you know, again, we, we only show the top line results. There's yes. more analysis that are ongoing. So a question about sort of the um, dose effects. Uh, maybe Nicholas, you, you can help us with that. Um, wh why do you think that uh, one dose was more effective than another? So less drug, 30 milligrams, more effective than 60? Well, you know, what you'd always like to see is a nice dose response curve, right? Where the, the higher the dose, the more effective a drug, unless it's toxic or has a lot of side effects. So I, I think it is a good point that what we, might have liked to have seen was a more effective um, response at the 60 milligram dose and some kind of a middle response, let's say at 30 milligrams. That said, um, that's part of early investigations for these drugs, like in a phase two study. And that is, can something be learned from what we've done so far that could be um, uh, modified in, in a later study. I think, I think my colleagues would agree that 60 milligrams is likely not the right dose to going forward, but why that should be uh, let's ineffective at this point, I just don't think we have a good handle on that. We certainly don't necessarily have a good handle on it, at least from the work that we did in our laboratory mechanistically, why that might not have had an effect. Right. And since I have you here, Nicholas, I, I, there's a question about mechanism of, of action. So the, the mechanism of action of CNMAU8 is thought to implicate NAD. And so uh, the question is, um, are you going to measure uh, the biological impact on upregulating the sirtuin genes? The sirtuin genes? Yes. Yeah, so that's those are really good questions. Some of these bio, some of these biomarkers like NAD and others can be actually really hard to measure in, in real time because they're very labile. Um, I think to your point about looking at biomarkers of other genes or other genes that could be regulated is a good one. And so I think that'll require some thought. We'd always like to see or to do something where we could see a signal that the drug is having some influence. And Michael, I don't know, you might want to comment a little bit more about how clean is thought about that. I think we're <clears throat> waiting to understand and see uh, additional data to see if the lack of effect for 60 milligrams um, is concordant or could be a chance finding. Um, I think in the work that we did with your lab, we generally saw that a higher dose was more effective. So it's something we're still evaluating carefully. Great, there's a few more statistical questions. So uh, have the causes of death in the active and placebo groups be, been revealed? And, and the, the person who's asking the question um, is suggesting that that information could be interesting to evaluate the meaning of the, of the survival results. Um, I, I will say it, they are known and we have um, throughout the trial, we have the DSMB, which is the Data Safety Monitoring Board evaluating that, including the medical monitor to see um, to make sure there's nothing that comes out with that information that would indicate there is a safety problem, um, which we did not see here. Um, I won't say it has been revealed, but we have been, um, I, I, I actually don't know if that is something that gets revealed, but it is something that we look at and we consider. And in defining our endpoints of mortality and PAV, um, those sort of things do come into play. So we're not ignoring them, but I don't know, Sabrina or Merritt might have a better answer for whether they ever get revealed. I think in the, in the final paper, when we're done with the full analysis and also done with regimen D, uh, that, that kind of information is shared. But as you mentioned, the, the DSMB has looked at that and there's no new um, you know, safety risk that's causing uh, that. that. So there's a couple of questions that essentially uh, relate to the numbers that we have seen in the 30 milligrams and uh, 60 milligrams. So perhaps, Lori, would, would you mind restating sort of, you know, the, the number of survival events that were seen in the 30 milligram versus 60 milligrams and how that compares to placebo? Sure, absolutely. Um, and, and as was said, any death is, is one too many death and I don't wanna discount that. Um, but I will share with the numbers that we saw. So the 60 milligram group um, had three deaths and one PAV out of a total of 61 individuals. Um, the 30 milligram group had one death out of a total of uh, 59 individuals. Um, the placebos in regimen um, C had 
three deaths and one PAV out of 41 individuals. There were less than 10 deaths overall in the larger placebo, shared placebo of 163 participants. Um, so we are seeing that the 30 milligram dose has a protective effect um, for survival um, as compared to both the regimen specific placebo and the shared placebo. These are what is called statistically significant. So it, there's indication that this is not what we would see by just chance alone, but I agree with the previous comment. The numbers are small um, and it's one of the uh, benefits of having the OLE because we'll have more time and more numbers to explore um, and make sure that this is a real effect. It's not something we want to ignore. However, in the 60 milligram group, it was very similar in terms of survival for 60 milligram um, participants as opposed to both the regimen C placebo and the shared placebo. The numbers were identical between uh, four out of 61 and four out of 41. I just want to add, because I see there's a question about the exact numbers. We cannot give the exact numbers on the on the pooled or the shared placebo until regimen D is, is finished. That's why we're not telling you the numbers. So there's also a high level question. So uh, do you think it's worth continuing EAPs and, and, and open label extension because of the um, exploratory analysis that was positive that was presented today or because it may be that the drug takes a longer time to work? So Mary, do you want to start? Yeah, I think a little bit of both. First, I wanna say it was pre, um, the survival by dose was, was all pre-specified. So every, uh, meaning that it wasn't post hoc kind of searching for things. It was pre-specified analysis. Um, we did feel strongly that it was important to give this as an option to people um, to continue because um, again, there's two studies now, the, the rescue and this one that have the similar type effect at 30 milligrams. And therefore, um, we thought that was an important option for people to have. And it will also give us additional longer term um, data on this drug um, if it does need uh, more time to, to even have more effect. Great. And I should mention that the person who asked the question also thanked Clean for um, valuing EAPs and allowing people to be in expanded access. So I would definitely echo that. Um, so there's a question about uh, what's next for the platform trial, uh, and specifically, do the results of the first regimens have any implications for the regimen that's enrolling right now, regimen E, or for the upcoming regimens? Mary, do you want to take that? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. You know, I, in the big picture, I don't think so, um, but we will obviously, when we're done with the all four, have a debrief uh, of all the data, and when we've done with all the analyses to see if we want to change anything. But um, even though we would have wanted, of course, uh, more of them to be uh, robustly positive, I think it is accomplishing what we wanted to do. So in, in two years, we, got, we have the results of three drugs, one which we stopped early because it wasn't going to work. And that's really important not to waste people's time. Another one was clearly negative. That was regimen B. And this one is giving us a signal on, on one of the two doses, uh, uh, which is what you want out of your phase two. Again, we're not, we're not done with analyses. We haven't done any of the fluid biomarkers analyses. So I think we're going to keep learning more. And then obviously we'll learn soon about regimen D. I, 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 I was just going to add that what's, um, you know, what's interesting is that we're not treading over the same ground. Each of the drugs uh, evaluated thus far really very different targets. And so it, it's not like we've done three of the same uh, of the same pathways, let's say. And there's probably a little bit of overlap, but but certainly nothing um, that's significant. So I think that's I think that means keep moving forward. Yeah. There's another question about sort of you know the AL, the, the scores at baseline for the people. Um, who did worse on the trial or ended up dying in the study. And the question is specifically, if you can tell us about their baseline ALS FRSR scores, I think that the question implies if they were worse to start off, um, to start with. So I can't answer that question directly, um, although I, I appreciate that's a very good question. Um, um, what I can say is that the groups themselves, so the two dose groups and the placebo group were very equal based on pre-baseline, so um, 
previous change in ALS FRSR score. And that's what we hope for. It's why we randomize. Um, specific to the participants who passed or had PAV, I have not looked at that subset specifically. Um, so I don't think I can answer um, that question more than to say it shouldn't have affected the differences between the groups. Great. I have one more question about this specific regimen and then a few about other uh, topics. So, um, so would you recommend that your patients stay in the open label extension for this drug? So I'll ask our clinicians, Merit and Nicholas, if you can comment on, on that. Hello, uh, Nick, do you want to go first? Well, obviously it's a very, a very personal decision. Um, uh, what I'm encouraged by is that it's, it seems to be that the drug has been well tolerated. And so I think from, this, from that in of itself is encouraging. I think for the other elements, we just, we just don't know. And um, again, it's a very personal decision, but if patients are well tolerating the drug well, I think that goes a long way into maybe a decision. Um, I, I agree completely. I, I am I, I, um, encouraging um, people, for example, in the EAP who have been on it for two to three years um, to continue. And then also on the open label, you know, at least till we have the next um, analyses, you know, uh, when we have the analysis of all the subgroups, the biomarkers, uh, the open label extension, we'll, we'll be a lot smarter in, in a couple months. Um, again, we, we did this on purpose to reveal the top line results as soon as we have. That's a good thing because people will know something, but it's a challenge because you don't know everything yet. And, and so we, we still have a lot of work to do. Great. I think it, we took all the questions that were specific to this regimen, but there's a few more that are more general. There's a couple of questions about AMX35. Um, so will AMX35 be allowed in the platform trial moving forward? Um, so thank you for asking that. So uh, we have spoken to Clean and Nanomedicine, the team, and, and they are they have agreed with, uh, uh, and we agree that in the open label, AMX 35 uh, would be allowed. So uh, we're going to share that with the, the, all the sites so they can share that with you. And then we're, we're in, um, we've, we've decided, we're deciding that also for the other regimens, which is all looking uh, like a positive, but we, we need to complete those discussions. Great. Any updates on regimen D? Uh, nothing yet. It's uh, we'll, we'll share the results as soon as they're available. And as uh, I know, uh, it's frustrating uh, because it, people ask every week, and I say the same thing, which is we're really not allowed by security exchange reasons to reveal any 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 dates or anything. But please know again, the team, uh, everybody's working as hard as possible um, because we know about the the clock, the ALS clock, uh, to get those results out to people. So Dr. Maragakis, there is a question directed to you specifically, and the question is whether uh, your center offers expanded access. Well, we're not part of this expanded access effort, no. So uh, the other question, it, it's a good question about um, the potential that some subgroups may experience benefit uh, on any of these drugs. I mean, the question specifically is for regimen B, or deeper start, I guess the same question could be asked for, for this regimen as well. Uh, do you want to comment on, on subgroup analysis and is it possible that a small group of patients may um, be responding more than others? I'll say for regimen B, because regimen B elected only to use the shared placebo from A, B, and C, and they didn't elect to use from D, we have run those subgroup analyses. And we did share uh, last week on the webinar that we, we didn't see any of the pre-specified subgroups that we had any, any particular group that, that had a benefit. But again, there, there's still a lot more um, analyses to, to do even there. And we haven't done them uh, at all for Regiment C. Th those won't happen until after Regiment D is locked. Great. Uh, there's a few questions that keep coming in. Um, uh, Mary, for future regimens, there's questions about you know the other uh, programs, for example, Ticomet ILB drug uh, may have had positive phase two results. Uh, is it possible that this drug or, or other new drugs may be used in the platform trial in the future? I think it depends on the results. I think once a drug becomes FDA approved, like the Amelix, then we we will allow it uh, in new regimens and we would stratify by a baseline, meaning 
that we would uh, ask people to be on it before they started the trial. And that way we could balance the groups by that so that we could interpret whether the new drug worked or not. So if IL-2 is, is positive and it becomes an FDA approved drug, um, then yes, it will be allowed. If it's not that clear and they need to do another phase three and it stays investigational, then it would not be. So we have to assess once we see the results of that trial. Yeah. So uh, not surprisingly, we have a number of questions about AMX 35. So, so, so Mary, perhaps can you restate again um, what our thoughts are about AMX 35, specifically the impact on regimen E, and in general, your thoughts about prescribing it? Yeah. So for regimen E, we're, we're still discussing this. We have a call coming up actually with our patient advisory group, and we had one call with our site investigators uh, yesterday and one again tomorrow. Um, so we, we don't have a final decision. What we're leaning towards, which I think is the right uh, right approach is that anyone not already in the trial, uh, we ask them if they wanna be on Amelix uh, drug that they started before uh, starting regimen E. Someone uh, already in open label extension for E, we're gonna allow them to go on Amelix. The people who are in the trial who have already started it, we're gonna ask them if they could please wait until their um, 24 weeks is over uh, because that helps us be able to interpret whether uh, regimen E works or not. Uh, but that, but if someone can't, um, obviously we're not gonna, we would never remove someone from a study. And we just ask that you have that discussion with your, your neurologist. So that's kind of where we're going right now. But as I said, we wanna to talk to our patient advisory group. I think that's happening next week. And then we'll, we'll issue kind of final decisions. It's a, it's a great problem to have. It's very complex. I don't know if Lori wants to maybe explain why it's complex to add a new drug in the middle of a trial. Um, okay, in sure. a few words. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. So, you know, as you know, we're, we're taking a lot of effort in making this in a way we randomize one group versus the other so that when we do see an effect, we know that it's the drug that is the effect, right? The difference between one group and the other, the only difference is one had an active drug versus a placebo. If we start adding a new drug in midway, that can sometimes complicate the analyses because we won't be able to parse out if it's the benefit of the new um, AMX35 or if it's really the benefit of this active drug that they're getting. And we wanna make sure we have the strongest evidence if uh, we see an effective drug to be able to say to the FDA, this is the reason why it's effective. We've done this in a really good way. We know it's this, and it's not just because people also got Amalex. Great. And I have a couple of questions that are coming in last minute. I can take them rapid fire. Uh, in terms of uh, prescribing AMX35 clinically, I would recommend that you talk to your clinical team. Uh, all clinics are basically getting ready for these. Um, and, and there's also kind of some options in terms of um, support for payment from the company. So again, I would refer you to your clinical team. There's a question about regimen B, the other regimen, the very deeper start regimen. Uh, and, and the specific question is if somebody was a participant and wanted to get expanded access. Actually, we have uh, discussed that with, with the company Biohaven. And so the recommendation would be to contact Biohaven directly. Uh, I would say work with your uh, investigator. In other words, if you are a participant at the specific site, your physician can help you. And certainly they can reach out to me or Merit and, and we can get them connected to Biohaven. And then I'm glad that somebody asked the um, enrollment information for Regimen E. Uh, so we are, we are a little bit, normally we always provide uh, the exact numbers for enrollment for Regimen E. And I'm sorry that we haven't done it um, today or, or last week, I think, uh, because of these breakthrough results. So Katrin, would you want to, to share the number for today? Sure. So as of this morning, the enrollment for people randomized within Regimen E, so that's people who have been dosed with placebo or active, that number is at 105. And again, as a reminder, the target is 160. So we're making good progress. Excellent. Great. And on that note, I would like to thank all our guest speakers. Really great to see these, all this team on this weekly webinar. Um, we will be back next week. Uh, and again, we'll continue to have guest speakers and lots of uh, ALS research news. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.